mics, but uh, let's uh, give a warm welcome to uh, Greg from Netflix. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, Okay, welcome to my talk. I'm going to be speaking on the uh, full cycle developers at Netflix. Um, this is uh, over the years, the edge engineering organization has evolved in how we build and operate our critical services. And we've gone from siloed teams all the way through a number of different uh, iterations and arrived at our current model, which we're calling the full cycle developer model. Um, I'm going to discuss some of the approaches we've tried over the years and talk about some of the uh, motivations that kept us uh, pushing forward to find a new model and uh, talk about some of the lessons we've learned along the way. Now, at this point, you're probably asking yourself, well, who is this guy? Who is Greg Burrell and why is he talking to me? Uh, hey, oh, Davey is here. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Okay, so my name is Greg Brell. I've been uh, at Netflix for 13 years. Um, 13 years ago, uh, Netflix was still a DVD-only company. Um, how many of you were DVD subscribers back in the day? Yeah. And how many of you uh, just asked yourself, wait, am I still a DVD subscriber? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had that disc last time I moved. Where did I put that? Yeah, um, so, you know, I, I was hired at Netflix um, to be the first tester on this little experimental startup within Netflix, and this, uh, this little tiny group was uh, playing around with the idea of sending this wacky idea of sending video over the Internet so uh, our customers could watch it at home without having to wait for those discs in the mail. Um, so I, I've been spent all my career at Netflix uh, within the streaming group. Um, I never really worked on the DVD side. Um, seven of those years I spent uh, on call for the streaming service. Um, you know, when I started, as I mentioned, we were a small sort of startup, so everyone wore multiple hats. And so I, I in addition to being the tester guy, I was the operations guy and the, uh, the sole support guy. So it was, uh, I spent a lot of years on that, but you know, as the needs of the business grew, we've also evolved our model for how we uh, sort of operated things. Um, as I mentioned, I started as a tester and then I moved into what we, our DevOps role and then now I'm an SRE uh, senior reliability engineer in the uh, um, developer productivity group. So I've mentioned edge engineering a couple of times and um, you're probably ask, wondering what that is. Uh, edge engineering is the organization within Netflix and we're responsible for a lot of the, uh, the majority of the Netflix tier one services. Uh, we, our services handle uh, things like sign up, like when you go and uh, someone wants to join and become a Netflix member. Uh, discovery and browse, like you sign in and you want to look around for something to watch, you know, you scroll through various uh, lists and get some recommendations, maybe watch some previews. Um, and of course, playback, you know, you find something, you hit the play button, maybe you skip to the next episode, you uh, pause it, you resume watching on a different device, you know, that's, that's all that stuff is going through uh, edge services. So despite the name, we are not just on the edge. We are several layers deep behind it. So this is sort of a rough uh, picture of, you know, as I mentioned, it just goes several layers deep. Um, everything front comes through our Zool front end gateway, but then uh, it fans out from there. Now, a lot of the uh, uh, different models we've tried has really been necessi necessitated by our growth. Um, we've grown in members, we've grown in headcount, and our architecture has really expanded uh, to meet the needs of the company. So along the way, we've uh, felt the need to stop and examine, you know, how are we, how we're operating uh, in terms of um, building and, and operating our critical services, um, and can we do better? And so we've, we're constantly striving to find a model that works better for us. Um, so where is edge engineering in 2018? Um, it's been a long road, but uh, we, you know, we have over 50 apps with only 80 developers really responsible for those apps, so it's a pretty good ratio. Um, deployments are now on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, one of the really nice things that developers are fully empowered to uh, quickly troubleshoot and remediate, uh, fix any problems in production. You know, the developers are the teams who are, are the people who are on call in the middle of the night. You know, they get woken up at 2 a.m. and from you know, the comfort of your couch and your pajamas, you can literally carry out the commands that will restore Netflix service to millions of customers around the world. You know, it can be a little daunting when you're sitting on your couch. Uh, 
uh, thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, millions of people are waiting to watch something, but you know, it's also an incredibly empowering feeling to know that you, you can just, you know, what's wrong. You, you have expertise in this area. You can go and fix it and make it uh, happen and restore those moments of joys to our, our members. Um, so one of the things that may be surprising is we have an edge, we have zero dedicated test teams and we have zero dedicated operations teams. So, you know, how did we, how did we arrive at this uh, current model of, of building and running our services? So uh, it's been a long journey, uh, which uh, going back into the mists of time, way back to 2007, we started out with something uh, it was more of a specialized teams model. You know, we had our, our developers, they wrote code and they proposed, you know, configuration changes. And at some point they gather up a bunch of those and throw it over the wall into test. And that's where I came in, you know, along with the test team, you know, we'd, we'd spend time testing all those changes and, and uh, there was no particular fixed schedule. It's just once we felt we had enough mileage on it, you know, a lot of the tests were automated, but there were quite a few manual tests as well. So uh, the, the cycle length was really not uh, fixed, but it just kind of varied as until we had a gut feeling that it was okay. And once we were ready, you know, then we'll open a change request ticket and have our network operation center execute those tickets. Um, back in this era, Netflix operated its own data centers. And so we had, you know, physical hardware and servers, and we had a network operation center that was the, really the guardians of those servers. You know, they were the ones who were allowed to touch them, to log in, to make any changes, to do anything on them. You know, our NOC, our network operation center was uh, staffed 24 seven. We actually had people on site, you know, staring at screens, staring at graphs, waiting for alarms, uh, carrying out work tickets um, to do these changes. So, um, when we when we typically wanted to do a new release of our uh, streaming soft uh, server software, we'd have to open one of these change tickets, uh, wait for the next uh, maintenance window, which would be like Wednesday at 2 a.m. or so, and then some uh, knock engineers would go through these tickets. And and so you know, it's literally you type in the ticket line by line, do this, do this, do this, you know, and someone would try and interpret that the best they could and carry it out, and hopefully the result was something close to what you had asked for. Um, our next model, we're jumping forward, uh, Netflix moved from our data centers into the cloud. And so we no longer really needed a network operation center to, you know, be the sole uh, gatekeeper, the sole guardians of our cloud infrastructure. Instead, uh, our developers were now empowered to have access to the cloud instances. You know, they could create instances, delete them, scale up, scale down, deploy new software of their own. Um, but at the same time, we didn't necessarily want our developers to have to focus on operations all day long. You know, we really want them writing features, bug fixes, new code. So we, we came up with this uh, model where, you know, during the day, developers could work on code features. And at night, they could be on call. And, and you know, they'd be the guys who get the pager and and... Uh, make fixes at night. So for the daytime, we we had a DevOps team, and they were the people who uh, were responsible for watching over production systems during the day. You know, responding to uh, fires and uh, doing deployments, and you know, hopefully, if we had extra time, we could work on tooling and stuff. And and similarly, uh, Netflix still had a central operations team, which we called Core, and they were sort of watching over all of Netflix, you know, looking for alarms and sort of coordinating incident responses if there was an outage or something, and they had to pull different teams together, and they could do the post-mortem follow-ups and such. So um, there were sort of three teams really in the mix, um, but it was also... Uh, there was, we were also sort of still operating in a very kind of mixed mode where uh, production support was split between different teams as well. And and the uh, central operations team, of course, was also uh, tasked with working on tooling in their spare time, which uh, nobody really had a lot of spare time those days. So as you've looked at these models, I'm, I'm sure you've a lot of, a number of pain points have uh, come to mind, you know, pretty obvious that you can see where these will break down. Um, one of the uh, most uh, one of the biggest problems we encountered was a lack of context. You know, um, with our rapid growth and change, it's really not possible to keep everyone up to date on uh, what's going on. You know, so um, 
uh, people who watched uh, the service at night, you know, they didn't necessarily know what had happened during the day, what changes had been made. They, they lost that key information. Um, you know, developers who just worked on code, they didn't necessarily know what was really going on in production, uh, what, you know, was happening out in the real world. Uh, people who were watching the production system, they didn't necessarily know the applications very well. Um, and they certainly didn't have a lot of insight into the changes that were uh, coming out. Um, we attempted to uh, uh, get around this um, with uh, a lot of communication, um, but uh, you know that came in the form of change logs, uh, which was often really just you know take all the commit messages and dump it into a text file um, with low readability. Um, we'd hand off meetings, you know, dev between dev and test, sit down, have a handoff meeting. Here's you know all the changes and what to look for, and then another handoff meeting between test and the uh, network network operation center. You know, hey, we tested this. Here's what we want deployed, um, and then a lot of long email threads. Uh, you know, so uh, as you can imagine, a lot of uh, troubleshooting, a lot of deployments was really just came down to hey, let's find somebody who knows this piece of information and, and try and track them down and share that. And, and maybe together we can piece together all the bits of information we need to either troubleshoot or to fix a problem. Um, so along with the, uh, the lack of context that leads to, as I just alluded to, this lengthy troubleshooting and uh, fixing cycles, um, you know, the, the, DevOps team and then NOC team, they could really describe symptoms, but they couldn't really theorize about root cause because they didn't know the applications that well. Our developers, you know, they could they could theorize about what might be going on, but they didn't have access to the actual systems to gather data, to validate those theories. Um, they didn't really know the current state of production, so they could kind of guess. So a lot of troubleshooting was really just, you know, conference calls where we get everyone on the, on the phone and, uh, it often went like, uh, you know, I'd get on the phone, I'd get called because maybe I was the guy who opened the change ticket. So, you know, I'd get on the call and a network operations person would be on the call and I'd say, all right, you know, um, uh, can you try restarting the application? You know, all right, here's how to restart it. What happened? Did it come up? Here's how you can tell if it came up. Can you turn down your TV? I can't hear you. Just saying, um, you know, uh, can you go look in the logs? Here's how to find the logs. Yeah, yeah. Tell me what you see. All right, not that, not that, not that. Maybe that. You know, can you cut and paste that and send that to me? And I'd get a mail with that cut and pasted lines, and then I'd maybe, if I couldn't make sense of it, I'd get a developer and mail that forward that to the developer, and the developer would say, oh yeah, I think it's maybe this, and they, you know, this email chain would really get kind of passed back and forth. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, our service is out and uh, people are, you know, trying to play something and getting very frustrated. So um, similarly, with a lack of uh, context and lack of understanding of the whole system, people tend to move cautiously and very slowly because no one wants to make it worse. Right. You know, I think I might know what's wrong, but I don't have the whole picture. And so I'm not going to I'm not going to just make a change. I, I could end up you know, making things much worse. So. Um, there was really, uh, you know, uh, a lot of pain in this process caused by lack of context and, and you know, high communications overhead. Um, another pain point we encountered was a, a very lossy feedback cycle. And, and by that, what I mean by that is, um, you know, developers would stay away from production. You know, they, they, the, I, I'm a developer. I write code. You know, the production is somebody else's problem. You know, that's we got people for that. And so they weren't necessarily aware of what was really going on in production. And so uh, the people who were handling production, um, we would often just kind of work around problems and those actual problem, underlying problems would never really work their way back up the chain. So for example, you know, if we noticed a uh, performance degradation, we might, hey, let's just add some more servers. Let's increase the size of the farm, you know, bring uh, metrics back down to normal levels and problem solved. Or uh, w if we were trying to get some insight, we might construct a, a dashboard with some various metrics and hopefully through those maybe infer what information we're trying to get um, really that you know the the proper fix would have been you know have the developers add some more visibility into the system or add some more metrics um, so that we can get a direct measurement of something we're trying to see um, you know once when I was on the uh, DevOps team and we noticed that uh, one particular application uh, very occasionally, you know, one of the servers would just uh, go bad, you know, it would, uh, latency would shoot up, you know, CPU would start spinning and maybe 
random crashes or something like that. And so, you know, by looking through the logs, you know, we realize, okay, this is a GC problem. It's GC like crazy, you know, it's running out. There's a memory leak here, right? So, you know, being DevOps people, we did what you expect. We wrote a script to randomly restart servers. Problem solved. <laughs> You know, of course, we opened a bug against the application and sent an email and, you know, I'm sure some developer picked it up and said, well, is it on fire? No, they've got a workaround, you know, low priority. All right. So it was months before we actually got the root cause of that fixed, you know, and and so, you know, this this is the sort of thing that we encountered just by, you know, developers not necessarily being on the front line to see these problems. And similarly, the people who were encountering the problems weren't necessarily uh, conveying that with the urgency or the importance that it priority that it deserved. So a lot of, a lot of um, loss of uh, feedback in that process. So um, silos, you know, as, as you can gather from those uh, diagrams I put up, you know, they were, it, we were really siloed, you know, each team had their own role. Nobody had clear uh, ownership of the uh, application from end to end. Uh, everyone had their one little part to work on and that was it. It was kind of like, uh, you know, being on an automobile assembly line, right? You work on your piece and it moves on to the next person. And so um, nobody uh, really had responsibility for end to end. And, um, um, so every everything we wanted to do had to be coordinated across these silos, you know. And if any silo was short staffed, you know, if if we you know we were short of testers, well, something can get held up and test even longer, you know. If we were uh, short on uh, knock engineers or DevOps engineers uh, to carry out this work, um, then they could they could sit for a while until we you know someone got around to it. So. One story that comes to mind, I think, uh, illustrates a lot of these pain points I've just mentioned. Uh, uh, one time, uh, the Netflix uh, streaming client team came to me, and this was a team that worked on the PlayStation client of the network's Netflix service. And uh, this this team was waiting for a feature to land in production so they could start testing against it. So naturally, they went to the NOC and they said, hey, you know, when's that feature going to be rolled out? And the NOC said, we don't know anything about it, and looked through their tickets and no, nothing. Uh, so naturally, you know, the, the client, the PlayStation team comes to me as a tester, you know, hey, Greg, when's that feature going to roll out? I never heard of it. Let's go find a developer. Go find a developer. She says, oh, yeah, I think that was done last week. Um, check with so-and-so because they worked on it. You know, he worked on it. So we tracked down so-and-so and he's like, yeah, finished it last week. Kicked it over to test, uh, which was really embarrassing because I was on test. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, I asked around my colleagues, yeah, I find the guy who, who tested it. He's like, yeah, I finished it last week. Well, why haven't we rolled it out? Oh, yeah, we're waiting for someone else to test this other key uh, component of the build. You know, at that time, our applications were very monolithic, and our release consisted of, you know, just gathering a huge bag of changes and uh, putting them all into one build. And so every one of those changes had to be tested individually before we could roll forward with the release. So, uh, so I said, okay, you know, I may, let me find the tester who's responsible for that component that's holding us up. So I find him and I say, you know, hey, you know, what's the holdup? You know, why can't we release? And he looked at me with kind of a mixture of surprise and annoyance. He's like, dude, I haven't even started yet. You know, we just released a couple of weeks ago. What are we going to push every month or something? <laughs> And this, I think, you know, to me, illustrates all these different pain points we encounter. You the silos, the high communications overhead, the lack of context, the lack of urgency, the lack of ownership over these features from end to end. Nobody, you know, each person really just had their own piece to do and kind of kick it off to the next piece, person. So even something as basic as finding out when is this feature going to be live really took a lot of legwork and physically going from person to person trying to figure put piece together this puzzle. So, you know, given all these pain points, we, uh, we ex developed a new model, which we call operate what you build, or the full cycle developer model. In this model, you know, the developers are really, uh, in, they don't just develop, they're responsible for all aspects of the software lifecycle, test, deploy, operations, support, uh, design, you know, and by support, I don't mean, you know, our Netflix customers call developers at home um, for questions. I mean, support to internal teams, support to like the client team I just mentioned, support to uh, other services that may interact with our service. Um, you know, these are all uh, partner teams that have questions and need help and need uh, some attention. So, you know, the developer is the person who has a lot of that information and can really help them with the problems. 
So under this model, you know, the developer is really empowered to uh, address all aspects of the life cycle. Um, the developer can really bring that engineering discipline, the creativity, the skill set um, to each aspect. You know, for example, um, our developers may, you know, look at our tests and say, oh, you know, these, this is not good enough. We need more testing and I have some better ideas for testing it, you know, so they can bring that engineering expertise to our tests. They can bring it to our operations, you know. Hey, our developers have been operating these uh, services in production. Um, you know, he or she may have some really good ideas for some tooling or some better, you know, that we can improve uh, how we operate. Um, the developer may have some good ideas for tooling that will ease the support burden and make that uh, smoother. And so, you know, we really uh, give our developers uh, full reign and empowerment to really attack any, any aspect of this life cycle that needs their attention. Um, so everything, everything in this uh, diagram is really open to a developer's perspective and attention. So, you know, it sounds like a great model. Um, obviously, it doesn't come for free. So what do you need to do to be on this model? What do you need to support it and make it work? Well, uh, one of the crucial things, first things is a, really a mindset shift. Um, you need to have your developer shift away from thinking, I only do code to think, you know, I own all aspects of this application, right? You know, um, shift away from, you know, I'm a developer, I, I design, write code, I don't deal with production, you know, shift into, um, you know, I, I wrote this code and now I'm going to put it out in production and now I'm going to support it in, in production and now I'm going to improve that process as well. Um, we want our developers to shift away from the mindset of, uh, sure, I'll deploy it, but I need to get this done so I can get back to my real job, you know, which is writing code. Um, each aspect of that uh, cycle is really the real job. Um, so, you know, obviously uh, going from just developing to doing all these aspects of the cycle, it requires support. And so that, that largely comes in the form of tools. You know, it's key that we have good tools. So at Netflix, we have central teams uh, that provide tools, uh, common tooling and infrastructure uh, to uh, support the developers, and in that way, these tool teams become really force multipliers. Um, and for so for you know, if if you're coming from a smaller, you know, I've gotten this question: if you're coming from a smaller company, you don't have central tool teams, or you don't have a lot of resources for central tool teams. Well, you know, there's a lot of great open source stuff out there. Some of it from Netflix, um, and there's as well as you know, SaaS solutions that may meet some of your needs, but. You know, it's really those tools that empower the developers to really do these all aspects of the life cycle. Um, and just to go into the tooling a little more, you know, some examples, uh, we use off the shelf tooling like you know, Jenkins or Artifactory, uh, Bitbucket, um, but we also have some homegrown tools like, uh, you know, our base AMI, you know, uh, we're on Amazon instances and we have a group within Netflix that provides that base AMI which on which we layer our applications. So each team doesn't have to be responsible for building the AMI from the ground up, you know, that part of it's taken care of them. So the, the base AMI team can roll in security fixes, can roll in latest technology. Uh, we have the Spinnaker team, you know, we, uh, back in the day, we used to use things like uh, uh, our custom scripts for deployment or um, uh, Asgard was an early tool for deployment, but it was very manual and uh, very error prone. So, you know, we've been working on a new tool we call Spinnaker, which will orchestrate a lot of this and has a lot of safeguards built into it. And so it's really made these uh, things like deployments a lot simpler, a lot safer. And so now a developer can just easily do their own deployments without having to, um, you know, follow a playbook or a script or anything like that. Um, Something else needed to support this model is training. Um, it's uh, imperative that you, you know, not, not necessarily physical training, although that would probably help during some of these long firefighting sessions, but no, really, uh, you know, we have developers who maybe only here to now focus on development and maybe their ops, you know, chops are a little rusty or maybe they've never really done support work. Um, so they need to be, you know, trained. We, can, we do that through a combination of, uh, boom camps as well as ongoing training and we have forums for sharing best practices, but really, you know, um, you know, developers want to build up those muscles in other areas, which they're not, you know, haven't been used to working in. Um, staffing, very important. Um, 
you know, at um, this point, you might just be asking yourself, you know, uh, hey, Greg, aren't, aren't what you're saying is, aren't you really just giving managers permission to fire their tests and operations people and dump all that work onto the developers? You know, is, is that what you're really saying? You know, is how is this not that? Well, no, what, what I'm really saying is that uh, in order for a developer to be able to handle all aspects of the full cycle, you really need to staff up for that. You need to give them uh, enough headroom that they can you know, address each, each aspect with the attention it deserves. Every aspect is a first class deliverable. Um, you know, if you try and cram in this operations work around development, it's not gonna work. If you try and cram in support you know, uh, in your free time, that's not gonna work. You know, you'll find that you have lower quality, uh, you have availability issues, and you'll definitely get burnout really fast. So it's very uh, important that teams are staffed with enough headroom um, such that you know developer can who who maybe only developed before now can have time to really address all those other aspects. Um, and, and finally, uh, commitment and prioritization are another key. You know, everything is a first class deliverable. Um, deployments are as important as writing new code. Uh, operations are as important as new code, new features. Support work is as important as testing, you know. Um, so these managers really have to be willing to support and uh, to invest in this and support their teams in this. Um, they all need to be prioritized equally um, and really need to build the trust of your developers that to let them know that, hey, you know, I'm gonna staff up, I'm gonna, you know, give time and resources to training and to tooling. And you know, you're not just, I'm not just dumping, you know, 5X the work onto you in the same amount of time. So as with, uh, you know, any model, there's trade-offs, you know, I, I'm certainly not saying this is the perfect model and it's all good. And if you adopt this, you, you know, you'll be like Netflix. Um, there's trade-offs involved, you know, and one of them is that it's, this model is just not for everyone necessarily, and it's not for every team. So the model I'm presenting is is for, you know, a lot of teams with an edge, but there are other groups in Netflix that have their own models. You know, that's one of the wonderful things about Netflix. You know, every, every team has the freedom and responsibility to figure out what's gonna work best for them to uh, build and operate their own software, uh, their own services. And so um, for some teams, you know, due to either the requirements of the team or staffing or uh, the technologies, um, it just, it may not work well for them. Uh, other teams may have arrived at a similar model, but you know, they are newer teams and they didn't have to go through that evolution. Um, this is uh, also not necessarily a model that's for everyone. You know, some developers that really just want to develop, you know, they want to, they want to become really specialists in one area and that's not a bad thing, but um, you know, it, they, they, this model may not be work for them. They may find themselves frustrated at having to do other th things that are not within their passions. Um, and, and the flip side of that is, you know, we've found some developers, uh, often really enjoy taking on these new challenges, broadening their skill set. Um, uh, there's a certain satisfaction in owning all aspects of the application, you know. Uh, you're empowered to not only write the feature, but to get it out there in the world and to improve it and see firsthand the effects of customers using it and get your own ideas for things you can do with it. Um, but, um, and, and this can also be a real opportunity, you know, um, for change. Uh, we've had developers on our team who worked under this full cycle for a while, and then they said, you know what, I I enjoy that, but now I want to I, work on something else. And so they'll switch to another team in Netflix. You know, we've had one developer move from the uh, one of the playback teams into uh, the chaos team. Um, I think they're now called resilience engineering. But uh, she moved into that because she really had some, you know, she had used the chaos tools as a full cycle developer, and she had some really good ideas for how she wanted to improve them. And she thought, you know, I can really bring my development skills to that team and and level up everyone through that way. And so um, that was very successful. You know, we had another developer. Um, he really liked developing. He also really liked operations. Um, so he decided to move on to the Spinnaker team, you know, which is kind of a combination of the two. And he, he that really aligned with his passion. And so uh, he found a really uh, good team there and has really done some amazing stuff over there. And I think another example is myself, you know, I started as a tester. When we got rid of the testers, I moved into DevOps. When we got rid of DevOps, I moved into SREs. So, you know, I've sort of, uh, my career sort of followed this evolution of how we uh, operate our services. Um, 
Uh, another trade-off is there's a real increase in breadth. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, going from a developer just thinking about development to now being responsible for all these other aspects, that's a, that's a you know, a big cognitive load. There's a lot to extra to take on things maybe you as a developer haven't previously been doing. And so, you know, we'll support you with the training, we'll support you with the tooling. Um, but, you know, it is more things that you're going to be responsible for. You know, some people really find that exhilarating and challenging and interesting. Um, but as a team, it's important that we are constantly aware that there is a risk of burnout if we don't, you know, support these developers in the ways that I described, you know, with the tooling, with the training, with the, the staffing headroom, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I think some, some developers find that there's a, a risk of getting interrupted too often, you know, uh, yeah, I, I want to focus on code and now I've got to do some operational work. Um, you know, I want to focus on a new feature, but I've got to do some support on it. You know, and that's, that's high priority. Um, so there is a risk of getting interrupted too often. You know, we've, one of the ways we've, uh, worked around this is by having on-call schedules for operations, on-call schedule for support. So, you know, the rest of the team can focus on development and maybe the on-call person for support, they'll be the one to answer the support channel and the support questions for this week, right? And then we'll trade, you know? So everyone stays up to date and fresh and gets the chance to uh, tackle things without necessarily too many interrupts on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, uh, teams really need to, as I've alluded to before, really need to balance these priorities. You know, everything needs to be given equal weight. Um, but the flip side of this, you know, as I mentioned, is that, uh, you know, whereas previously you were maybe as a developer only focused on one narrow slice, now you can focus on the full breadth uh, of the life cycle of your product or application. Um, and, and, you know, there is a real satisfaction in understanding the whole entire picture of your application. You know, previously you had a very narrow slice of it that you knew, the stuff in your silo, right? Now you understand it end to end. You know, you, ha you, you have the real world experience of seeing your application out there, of supporting it, of um, getting it adopted, of, you know, pushing your own new versions of it out on a daily basis. Um, so that's a really empowering feeling. Uh, and finally, another trade-off to be aware of is just, you know, there's cost to this, as I've, as I've mentioned before, there's a real cost. You know, it requires investment. It's not something you can do, you know, just on good wishes. It really needs commitment, commitment of your manager and your whole team to have bought into this. You know, you can't kind of take part of the team and have them follow this as an experiment. You know, it's, it, it, uh, really won't work out. You need commitment from everyone that, you know, hey, this is how we're going to operate as a team. So what's next? Um, you know, I, I certainly don't uh, mean to imply that this model is the gold standard of at the end of the road, we've figured it out. Um, no, there will always be uh, uh, room for improvement and change. Um, tooling, tooling is a big one. There's always room for better proving, tooling to improve our operations, to improve our deployments, to improve our support. You know, uh, uh, we need we can build tooling that is easier to use, tooling that is opinionated, tooling that has the best practices built into it. You know, so uh, a tool is no longer something that is complex to use. We, you know, uh, one of the feedback we hear is uh, people say, "Oh, you know, I've got." all these different tools I need to become experts in. Well, that's that's really not what we're hoping. We want, you know, we don't want you to become an expert in all these tools. We want to build the tool that will be so easy for you to use that you don't have to be an expert. You can use that tool, get do what you need to get done, and then, you know, you can uh, go on to focus on the next aspect of life cycle that needs attention. Uh, better tooling will eliminate a lot of toil, you know, those uh, low-level maintenance type tasks that are redundant and, you know, you follow a, a playbook or something to do them. Um, you know, it's the maintenance work that people don't like to have to do. They find the you know, unrewarding. And so a lot of that can be automated through our tooling. Um, and tooling can also reduce a lot of this cognitive overhead that I just described. Um, something else we're looking to improve is metrics. Um, you know, how could we want to be able to measure each aspect of this life cycle? You know, how 
how are we doing in terms of deployments? You know, what's our success rate? What's the causes for deployment failures? You know, um, how are we doing in terms of support? You know, is it going well? Is it not going well? Can, can we quantify that and get some measurement on it? Um, by by getting these metrics, we'll be able to know where to invest in, you know, which areas. Hey, maybe we're doing great in testing, but we're not doing so good in support, right? Let's put some more resources and focus on the support aspect and maybe build some tooling there or something to, to shore up that, uh, to raise up that aspect of it to the rest of uh, the cycle. Um, and finally, you know, we're looking at metrics to measure ourselves, you know, how we're doing uh, to measure our productivity, to measure the complexity of our applications, the complexity of our environments, um, uh, metrics to measure our team health. You know, I, I've alluded to the risk of burnout a few times. You know, it, is is that something that can be hinted at through metrics, you know, team metrics, productivity metrics, uh, operational metrics, availability, you know, um, if our availability uh, of our service starts to suffer, then, you know, maybe that alludes to other problems. Um, you know, we can do a lot of guesswork back it with some data and and so we're we think there's a lot of room for uh, improvement in the area of metrics about how we're as doing as a team um you know so our journey is ongoing you know we're constantly asking ourselves is this the right model uh you know do we uh how can we get better? Our Netflix is constantly growing. Our, you know, membership is increasing, base is increasing. Our headcount, you know, we're hiring like crazy. Uh, our architectural complexity is growing and our technology stack is really growing. And so, you know, with these, with this growth, with these changes, you know, does this model still continue to hold up? You know, can it be sustained? Um, it's a good question. You know, it's something we're constantly asking ourselves, and I think it's a uh, you know something we need to constantly be looking at so we don't get to uh, you know rely on this model. Um, and uh, you know, one question is, you know, is is does this model work uh, as we grow, you know, to 5x or 10x, you know, um, right now with an edge, we're really divided into a lot of smaller sub teams, you know, will this model work on something, you know, bigger than a dozen people? Um, so, you know, these are some really, you know, questions we constantly ask ourselves and try and, you know, figure out. Um, and, and as well, you know, there are companies that are, you know, been around a lot longer and are more mature. And so I know there's a lot we can learn from those companies. You know, maybe they've uh, gone through these growing pains and have arrived at a slightly different model that we can borrow from or, or adopt, you know. So um, one of the, you know, really nice things I like about Netflix is, you know, yeah, these are fair questions to ask, you know, and so every team can ask them on their own, you know, they have that freedom to do so. And so um, this is this is the way we've sort of evolved to the current model we're at. So I'd like to um, uh, leave you with a story that came to mind as I was writing this out. And, uh, you know, I, uh, as you know, you know, Netflix hires a lot of people like crazy. And so we hired somebody earlier this year, a developer. And I, uh, I went to a team lunch and I sought out this developer and I said, hey, welcome to Netflix. How's it going for you? And he got very excited and he got really animated. He said, oh, I tell you, um, today is a really good day. You know, today I did my first deployment production push on my own. And not only that, I have my first feature out in the world in front of customers. You know, I put together a dashboard. I've been watching my feature roll out. I've been looking, you know, watching adoption. I've been watching for errors. You know, I already have some ideas on how I can improve it and some bug fixes. I'll roll those out next week. He said, you know, I tell you, this is so exciting. I've been at Netflix for two weeks. I still have code changes in my previous company that are making their way through that system. You know, this is this is amazing. And so to me, that, that really sort of, uh, uh, you know, illustrates what we had been hoping to achieve with this full cycle developer model, the sense of empowerment, the sense of ownership, the sense that, you know, our developers can have uh, control over the, their features, their applications, their systems, and uh, can make those changes and see their, you know, rewards, their fruits of those labors. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Do we have any questions? I'm going to give you the mic so it can be on the recording. No one. Yes, there's one right here. Saw two. So you mentioned that uh, the engineering team is responsible for their service. 
Mm-hmm. But when a customer finds an issue, or let's say it's impacting 10%, 20% of your customers, how does that issue make it all the way back to that service team? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, for one thing, our engineering teams are very much uh, in contact with, you know, if a customer finds an issue, it's typically um, will surface to the uh, team that's responsible for the client that that customer is using, you know, if they're on a iPhone or if they're on a you know, TV, a smart TV, or if they're on a laptop or whatever. Um, typically, we will find those problems before customers notice them, um, just because we are such a, a metrics-heavy company. You know, we really have invested a lot into metrics and, and more than that, into insights that that take all those raw metrics and, and, and assemble them into more meaningful information. Um, but if a customer does report some sort of issue, you know, that will... Uh, uh, make its way through customer service, you know, uh, they will let us, they will directly contact some of the engineering teams and say, you know, this is a problem we're encountering, or they will contact the uh, core team and say, you know, uh, customers are reporting this and core will know who to reach out to. Um, but quite frankly, you know, if it comes to us that way, we feel we've missed an opportunity. You know, we, we really should invest better in metrics and insights and tooling to have caught that at a sooner stage. If it's 10 to 20% of our customer base, we've heard about our, all kinds of alarm bells are ringing. So, so to Greg's point, I think the ones that come through CS are more um, sort of slow burning, long tail type of issues. Sure. So, so in terms of services, you mentioned that you have a lot of customers that are The follow-up question is if you have hundreds of services, the challenge is that let's say there's a cascading failure between services, right? So let's say 20% of the customers are impacted, but it's an issue that's impacting, let's say 20 of your services. How do, how are these teams getting together uh, to first isolate the problem to a particular place in the stack yeah. and then going about solving it? Yeah. So if, if say, for example, we experience an outage with 20% of our customer base, you know, um, when that happens, there's usually a couple of things. One is it's usually regional. So we, uh, even before we we try and root cause anything, our core team will s- spring into action and really just shift all our traffic to a different AWS region. Um, that almost always immediately solves the problem, and then we can have the, a little more time to start root causing what went on. Um, similarly, the, the core team will um, also start coordinating a uh, response, an incident response, a uh, you know call in. All you know, we have we have the metrics, we have the alert, alerts, we have the information. We know which teams are involved, so we start getting them together. Um, but something else that we're doing that's really exciting, you know, I mentioned, you know, the the future holds more tooling. And we're starting to we're building tools that do a lot of this correlation work for us. You know, so if you have problems with twenty different systems, you know. These tool we have all the metrics. Our tooling can you know look at those just systems, figure out when different alerts went off, sort of correlate it down to a root cause or or at least a localized area where we can investigate. So one more question. So there's the uh, the paved road experience for mm-hmm. developers. Yes. Um, I, like what percentage of teams are using that approach versus what percentage of teams aren't? And do you ever go look at like those teams that aren't using the paved road experience to see what they're doing mm-hmm. um, to try and say like, hey, can we expand what the tooling team is doing and offering so that we can bring those teams into the fold? Okay. Um, actually, I have the exact person to answer this question. You're going to punt to me. So, uh my team at Netflix manages portions of the paved road. And so to answer your question, we definitely will identify which teams are on and which ones are off. And we'll try to reach out to the ones that are doing something different and figure out usually the conversations around what features or what capabilities are in the current paved road that, you know, are preventing you from using this. And, and oftentimes like, you know, Ed and Joel back there will often use that as an opportunity to improve our tool set. Uh, sometimes it'll be an opportunity for us to talk to Atlassian about improving their tool set. Where's Dan? There it is. Um, and sometimes there is a miscommunication. So there's, there's a number of reasons why people won't be using our tools. Um, and it's usually an opportunity to, to understand why. What is it? Like, what's the... So it depends on which tool we're talking about. So for instance, there's... At the most expensive level, it's version control. 
uh, continuous integration and binary storage for artifacts. So those, the majority of the teams are using those. Um, when you start getting into language specific stacks, so for instance, um, a lot of the stack you're talking about, Java specific, um, either using some I, various IPC frameworks that are supported by a couple teams. And so there's a very specific stack there and that's a smaller percentage of the number of projects at Netflix. And then you have kind of this long tail of like, for instance, some teams using Python on, on a Spark uh, service. And, and so we have minimal support for that type of use case. So it varies, so. And just to add to that, um, uh, we also have the, uh, we have our central teams providing tools. We also have the concept of local central teams. So if, for example, edge engineering has some very specific needs, our, our local central team can supply some tooling to meet those very specific needs. But then we often work with the central teams to maybe take our, you know, leading edge tooling and, and roll it back up into the paved road as well. So uh, a lot of this really falls under freedom and responsibility. You know, where each team is free to sort of stay on the paved road or to investigate other options. And, you know, sometimes another team will uncover a great tool or something that we all learn from and adopt, you know, and so it makes its way that way as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, what I was curious about as well was is sort of Pulver's push was were these changes mandated or Never were people sort of allowed to adopt. Never, there, there are people are allowed to adopt. There's very few things we mandate. Obviously, some you know in the area of security and things like that, we have to uh, you know uh, uh, mandate some things. But uh, other than that, you know, there's a lot of freedom to do what works best for your team and to you know your team can explore different options. Um, you know, there's a lot of benefit to staying on the paved road because you'll get great support, you'll get you know new features and things like that. But you know, maybe you want to have explore some other you know side road you know maybe you want to blaze your own trail through the underbrush you know as well so um you know they're, they're free to do that and no one is really told no get back on the paved road right. a quick question sure. so you did mention that uh, teams have the um you know the ability to develop their own tools and mm -hmm. if that is good the entire uh, company can start adopting that um, so there are a couple of uh, pain points there, which we've felt uh, in, in our teams also, which is there's some loss of consistency across the different tools. And also most of these tools are not necessarily utilities, but then they could be services. So there's a problem with discovering all these services and also for all these services to talk to each other to ensure a unified experience for the developer. So how do you ensure that problem? Yeah, that, that's a that's a good question. You know, we do have that problem of of you know some team develops a tool and others want to use it. Well, that team doesn't necessarily want to be in the tool building business or tool supporting business, right? Um, they they have their own real applications that they want to support. But so a lot of times, you know, those tools will be given out as, hey, you know, it's it's uh, something you know there's enough need among different teams that we're going to have a central team take on adopt this tool and fold it into some other offering such that we can get that support and not only support but a consistent you know uh, user experience and so we really don't we really try and get away from this idea of having you know very specific tools that you know as i mentioned earlier you know you don't have to be an expert in this tool and then be an expert in this tool and this tool and then try and keep up to date on all that you know so we're trying to uh, integrate these tools in such a way that it really feels like a seamless experience and a lot of the uh, you know expertise is sort of uh, uh, abstracted away for you and and there are you know the best practices that you probably would be doing are just built into that tool so greg you're gonna stick around after yes i'll be around after just awesome. uh, if you want to chat or ask questions or anything just find me so uh thank you greg and then we'll get ready for our Sweeney.